All right, hello, and welcome back. This is chapter four out of the Essential Cosmic Perspective book. Chapter four is over motion, energy, and gravity. <clears throat> so our goals for this chapter, examples from everyday life of motion, are how do we describe motion and how is mass different from weight? So we have these equations, and I'm going to tell you right now, you don't need to remember these equations. But they're helpful to see how they work. We're going to find speed, velocity, and acceleration. <clears throat> speed is the rate at which an object moves. It's the distance it travels divided by the time it travels. An example of that would be 10 meters per second. Velocity includes a direction to that. So a velocity would be 10 meters per second due east. All falling objects accelerate at the same rate. This is considered the acceleration due to gravity. And on Earth, we're going to round this to now 10.8 uh, meters per second squared. And so the speed increases 10 meters per second every second that object is falling. <coughs> Galileo, we talked about him, showed about g, the value of g, 10 meters per second, is the same for all falling objects regardless of their mass. And at the Apollo 15 mission on the moon, they took a hammer and a feather and they dropped them both at the same time. It's an iconic video now. And they both dropped to the surface of the moon at the same time. Now let's talk about momentum and force. Momentum is just the mass of the object times its velocity. And if the object is moving in a rotational manner around a circle, we call that angular momentum. So how is mass different than weight? Mass is just the amount of stuff that object has in it. Weight takes into account the force of gravity that acts on that object. <clears throat> so it is possible you can be in a free fall in an elevator if it were to disconnect from its cable lifting it up. So why are astronauts weightless in space? There is gravity in space, but the weightlessness is due to a constant state of freefall, meaning the, the spacecraft is falling all the time towards Earth, but it's at such a height and a velocity that it's constantly falling back towards Earth, and that generates the weightlessness feeling. So we know distance is the equation of distance divided by time. Speed and direction equals velocity. Change in that velocity is the acceleration. And momentum is the mass times that velocity, so they all tie in together. Mass is how much stuff there is, while weight is the force of gravity acting on that mass. And so the weight may be different on the Earth versus the Moon or Mars or Jupiter or wherever you may be. And objects are weightless in freefall. Now let's take a look at a really big concept: Newton's three laws of motion. So we're going to look about look at how did Newton change our view of the universe, and what are Newton's three laws of motion? So Newton uh, realized <clears throat> the same physical laws that operate on Earth also operate in the heavens, one universe. He discovered the laws of motion and gravity, and along with that, he discovered experiments of light, the first reflection, reflection telescope, and in his spare time, Newton invented calculus. I can tell you calculus is not something easy you just take in school. It's, it's, it's pretty tough. So here's Newton's first law. And I'll, I'll read you what the text says on the screen, and then I'll give you my own definition. So it says Newton's first law of motion is an object moves at constant velocity unless a net force acts to change its speed or direction. Simply stated, that I would say it as this, an object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest, unless acted upon by an outside force. So here is his second law of motion. The force of an object is its mass times acceleration. And the equation for that is F equals M times A. Newton's third law of motion states for every force there is always an equal and opposite reaction force. And that's how I would state it. <clears throat> so on the shuttle here, 
you have this force of the thrust of the rocket boosters going down, and that thrust pushed against the shell to push it up. So we learned that Newton had discovered the laws of motion and gravitation. He realized these, these same laws of physics were identical in the universe and on Earth. And we talk about Newton's three laws, which you can summarize here. And now we also have conservation laws in astronomy. So the goals here are what keeps the planet rotating and orbiting the sun, and where do objects get their energy from? So the total momentum of an interacting object cannot change unless an external force is acting upon them. Interacting objects exchange momentum through equal and opposite forces, Newton's free laws at work. So objects conserve angular momentum, and the angular momentum of an object cannot change unless an external twisting force, which we call torque, is acting upon it. And the Earth experiences no twisting force as it orbits the Sun, so its rotation and orbit will continue indefinitely. And so the classic example of this is an ice skater who is rotating on her skates, and she pulls her arms in to rotate faster, and so her angular momentum is closer to her torso or the body, and so she rotates faster to strengthen that radius. So energy is what makes matter move, and energy can be conserved. But it can also transfer from one object to another, and it can change in form. While it does that, the total amount of energy does not change at all. It's just conserved or transferred. So the basic types of energy we have are kinetic, which is motion energy, radioactive, like light, uh, radiative, and stored or potential energy, which is like holding a ball off of a tall cliff. The energy, again, can be changed but it cannot be destroyed. So we can think of thermal energy, the collective kinetic energy of many particles related to temperature. The temperature is the average kinetic energy of the many particles in a substance. And in temperature, we have three scales we generally use in science. We are very familiar with the Fahrenheit scale. 32 degrees, water freezes, and 212 degrees, water boils. Uh, the Celsius is a little more simpler, actually. Zero, it freezes, and 100, it boils. And then we can use the Kelvin scale, which is simply a derivation of the Celsius scale. Uh, and we talk about that in, in more astronomy terms. And so thermal energy is a measure of the total kinetic energy of all the particles in a substance. And it depends on both the temperature and the density of that object. In gravitational potential energy, on the Earth, it depends on an object's mass, the strength of G, which we know on the Earth is 9.8 or 10 meters per second, and the distance an object could potentially fall. But in space, an object or a gas cloud has more gravitational energy when it's spread out than when it contracts. And a contracting cloud converts gravitational potential energy into thermal energy, just like that rotating skate, uh, uh, skater did. So mass in itself is a form of potential energy. And here we see Einstein's favorite equation, E equals mc squared, where E is the energy involved, m is the mass involved, and c is a constant for the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. Squared is a big number that you square. So a small amount of mass can release a great deal of energy like if you see in a nuclear bomb or atomic bomb. <coughs> So like we said, in conservation of energy, energy can neither be created or destroyed, but it can change form from one to the other. But the total energy that was existent in the formation of the universe 13 billion years ago is the same energy in the universe today. So we know that conservation of angular momentum means a planet rotating over the sun will continue to do so, and energy gets their the object of the energy from conservation of energy that cannot be created nor destroyed, and that the energy can come in three types, kinetic, potential, and radiative. And finally, the force of gravity. We're going to learn about what determines the strength of gravity, how Newton's and Kepler's laws extend to gravity, how do gravity and energy together allow us to understand orbits, and how does the energy of gravity cause tides. 
So we have the three laws of Newton about gravity and energy, but now we have one big law that kind of encompasses all of it together, and that's the universal law of gravitation. And what it says is this, every mass is attracted to every other mass. The attraction is directly proportional to the product of their masses. And attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Well, what does all that ghibli you talk mean? You see on the screen here an equation. The force of gravity is equal to this big G, which is different than little g. Big G is a gravitational constant. It's just a small number with the right units attached to it to make the equation work out nice. And it does include two masses of two objects and the distance between them. What it really says is this. If two objects are uh, two meters apart, and then you move them double the space, four meters apart, their force is going to be inversely proportional to that. And so if you double the space between the two objects, they will be four times less massive to each other. If you take the distance and triple the distance, then they will be one-ninth as forceful to each other. And that's what that means. And so Kepler's first two laws apply to all orbiting objects, not just planets. And ellipses are not the only orbital paths. They can be ellipses or parabolas or hyperparabolas. And so Newton kind of generalized Kepler's third law into if a small object orbits a larger one and you measure the orbiting objects, then the orbital period and average orbital distance can then you can then calculate the mass of the larger object. And this really is what I did in my research as a grad student at Missouri State University. I was looking at two small, low mass faint stars. And I looked at their interaction between each other. How long do they take to orbit each other? How much gravity did each one have? And from that, I could detect the masses of each individual star. And that is the only way that we have in astronomy to detect the mass of a star is that they are in an eclipsing binary system. We know of probably eight to 10,000 eclipsing binary systems out of the billions and trillions of stars there are. So each one gives us a better perspective on what masses of stars mean. And the mass of the star determines how that star will live and how it will die. And we'll get into that in the third part of the course later on. But on the low mass scale, and I mean like a fifth of the sun's mass, we have very, very little data on the masses of those small mass stars and how they evolve. They tend to live longer than most average stars, up to a trillion years, theoretically. And so I uh, determined the mass of two of these stars. Only eight have been known to that point in 2009 when I discovered these two. And so my contributions really added a lot to that discussion. So you don't need to memorize this equation. It's just Kepler's third law in Newton's form. Just saying that uh, the period of the object so in a gravitational constant, you can get the masses for the two objects. You have the orbital uh, direction of the objects. And so this can tell you uh, a lot about these stars. And so escape velocity is the speed or velocity that an object must have to escape the Earth's gravity. So from Earth, this is 11 kilometers per second from sea level. 40,000 kilometers per hour, about 25,000 miles per hour then. Now, how does gravity cause tides on the Earth? We don't really deal with tides in Missouri very much, but the moon's gravity pulls harder on the near side of the Earth than it does on the far side of the Earth. That makes sense from Newton's and Kepler's laws. And so the difference is it stretches the Earth's tides towards the moon. Now, we can also have tidal friction, that force of the water moving against the Earth can slow Earth's rotation down and make the moon, therefore, go farther away from the Earth. The moon did once orbit faster, and tidal friction caused it to lock into a rotation that kept the same side of the moon facing the Earth at all times. 